Okay, hi everyone, <laughs> and welcome. Welcome, welcome to Solutions House 2024. <laughs> Woo! Thanks, guys. <laughs> so thank you for taking the time to be part of our third annual Solutions House at Climate Week. Uh, this is a space created by Futera and Google, an exponential roadmap. And for the first year, we've had the um, uh, Sustainable Entertainment Alliance join us as well, come on board as a partner. So uh, uh, an enormously warm thank you to all of our partners who've made it possible to put this on. Now, the motto of Solutions House is answers only. <laughs> and uh, the problems we face are significant, but they are widely discussed elsewhere. So in this panel and all of them, we will be really focusing on that. We have three days of incredible programming. We have films, we have storytelling, we have non-boring accountancy frameworks. Um, we've got level up on corporate action. So again, thank you to all of our partners. Now, this is the first year that Solutions House has graduated from the Futera office. So this is our fabulous new venue, um, but the same deal applies. Uh, if you need any help, Futerans are here to help you and Tagger to the Dog is here, who was, as I say, the star of the show last year. There are no fire alarms scheduled. Um, please follow exit signs if you do hear one. This session is live streamed and recorded, including the questions. So if you are, ask a question and we encourage you to do so from the floor or from around the world, um, then you will be part of the proceedings. Um, we've got two hashtags, Solutions House NYC and Climate Week NYC. Um, so please do feel free to post and share. Now, I'm Lucy Shea. I'm the CEO of Futera. I'm a trustee of Futera Solutions Union. And we work day in, day out on big solutions and storytelling around climate. And that is why I am delighted to introduce this next panel, um, which is around the video gaming industry and how we can reach 3.3 billion people on this. And I'm gonna to pass to Sam Barrett, uh, who's the Chief of Youth, Youth and Engagement at UN Environment Programme, to uh, run the panel and take us away. So Sam, thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, good morning. Um, it's good to see you all online and in the room. Um, what we wanted to do in the next 50 minutes is just to introduce the journey that we've been on for the past five years, um, where we have learned and where have we kind of really grown and what have we learned that we need to improve on. So today is quite an important day for us. This is our fifth year anniversary since we started this. And we also have two of the people that helped found this sitting alongside us on the left of me. So I just want to introduce the panel briefly. Uh, so first we have uh, Lisa Pack, who is the uh, head of operations for Playing for the Planet. And she used to run a lot of the planning for WUGA, one of the big uh, studios in Germany. Uh, then we have Matthias Norvig from Cybo, who's the CEO of the most downloaded game in the world, Subway Surfers. And then we also have Dr. Trista Patterson, who has co-founded Playing for the Planet from more than day one. She and I have worked on this for many years. And she's now the Director of Sustainability uh, at uh, Microsoft Xbox for Games. And she's also uh, in the Time 100 Top Green Leaders as well. So it's great to have you all here. So thank you for coming. What I wanted to do is maybe just do a quick introduction. So this is the panel which I've introduced. Um, and I'm just going to run through a little bit of context to start this off. Um, there's a bit of sound feedback, which is something I hope we can fix. Um, but the first thing to say is that the industry is big and it's probably the largest entertainment medium in the world. And the numbers are extraordinary and they outcompete film and music in many cases. But what I think is fascinating about this is the size of the audience, but it's not just the scale, but it's also the audience is within a medium which can be incentivized to make different choices, are socialized to work together and can do things in a way that I think other entertainment mediums don't have the capacity to do. So I think the games medium is special, it's unique, and it's got an incredible potential. We started this in 2019. Uh, UNEP facilitates this initiative, and so far there are 49 members. Uh, you can see many of them here, um, from China, from India, uh, from Africa, uh, but also from Europe and, and North America. We have many people from many places. 
And there are a very simple set of goals we have. One is to decarbonize and reach net zero, use the industry to engage people on environmental themes and innovate through special projects. And the premise of this is to work with games with a pre-existing audience that you can integrate activations where people already are, rather than build games from the ground up to try and attract an audience that may or may not come. So decarbonization is something we spent a lot of time on thinking about what is the unique complexity of hardware software, where do the boundaries stop and start, and to really work to provide tools to the industry to really go on that journey, to set a net zero pathway where they can understand, measure, and reduce their emissions. And also you'll hear from Lisa about the Green Game Jam with all the work we've been doing to inspire act actions in games. And so what I think Playing for the Planet is, is a community of practice where we try to lead the way, help people learn and level up. And the spirit of this is really about creating a group of practitioners that are happy to learn and share and work together. So what I'd like to do is just share with you a very short film of the progress we've made to date. And uh, I'm just gonna ask our colleagues upstairs to see if they can press play. I think one thing that people don't easily understand about the gaming industry from the outside is how important the spirit of connection is to the industry. And that for me, in terms of the superpower of getting anything done or bringing it to scale or making something viral and contagious and making it grow exponentially is the power of human connection. The gaming industry is a shocking mix of some of the most creative, artistic, but also extraordinarily technically adept creators that I've ever encountered. The kind of electrical engineering that people do behind the scenes to maximize the efficiency of devices and create experiences in the human realm is unlike anything I've ever seen. And so for that, when I think of <clears throat> the fact that it was five years ago today, was it today? So happy anniversary, guys. <laughs> five years ago today, we started the Playing for the Planet Alliance at UN General Assembly. And when I think back to those nuggets or that twinkle in the eye, or just an inkling or a suspicion that we might be able to do something with the gaming industry. Again, at that time, it was very off the radar. It was not a valid way. It was certainly not endorsed by the UN as being a media element. It wasn't viewed as an aspect of valid engagement. All of those 3.3 billion gamers are effectively, in terms of the people that they represent, are, had, had been effectively off the radar from one of the most important mechanisms for communicating about environmental change, but also activating people to communicate and connect and create and also find ways to gamify the problems that they encounter, the different ways in which they might approach solutions, the way they might join together, the way they might fundraise, and activate each other in creating new things. We were told it was virtually impossible to bring gaming to, be, to have the kind of validity that it currently has in the UN, thanks in great part to so much of the great work that Lisa and Sam have been doing, <coughs> and the whole rest of the Playing for the Planet team. Um, but we've come so very far, and that power of engagement is something so extraordinarily strong that I'm really excited. We've got another video from Microsoft that we can share for you talking about the full way in which that power of connection is engaging people all through the life cycle, and hopefully we'll have the sound here to be able to play that for you. Um, but in celebration of our five-year anniversary and also looking back to when we established sustainability at Microsoft, I'm really proud to share with you all of the impacts of that human connection amongst our workforce to bring down emissions from 
use phase emissions on console. To date, and I'm only talking about the data that's included in the Microsoft sustainability reports that have already been published, but between fiscal year 2020 and 2023, we have prevented 1.2 million metric tons of emissions going to the atmosphere. So that's not carbon credits, that's not renewable energy or anything like that. That's purely from connection and empowering game creators to game their code or to green their code to reduce the energy consumption without affecting any game performance. It's completely unnoticeable, even to the studio's own artists. And also to empower through connection our gamers to opt into energy saver mode. So that's a shutdown mode that reduces power when it's on standby by 95%. And to do things like carbon aware and also active hours. So that allows all of the downloads and up uploads on the console to happen at a time when renewable energy, where the console is located, to be, to be most likely to be drawing on renewable energy. Again, without disrupting experience. So when you look at that 1.2 million metric tons of emissions prevention, according to the EPA, it's the equivalent of about preventing three billion car miles worth of emissions from going to the atmosphere. I'm really proud of that because it took the power of connection across our whole workforce. And with the way in which so many companies are looking at their sustainability commitment, there's a really important activation point when we look at the power of connecting our employees to see the possibilities that are right underneath their noses so that they can do what they do already best, but optimize for climate solutions. So I really think that that is the superpower of the industry. Just building in a, a piece of telemetry that allows you to see what emissions are being used and finding ways to reduce it at source is much better than doing anything further downstream. So I think what, what Xbox have also done, which Chris has mentioned, they've got a sustainability toolkit, which they've shared with AAA studios around the world. So this IP and this approach can be shared and picked up by many. So there's a real generosity, I think, coming through in the industry that's quite different from other things I've seen, whereby if people stumble into things that unlock huge opportunities for emission savings, and that's shared with others so they can build off that as well. So I think that's something that's quite special that I've come across. Mm. Thank you, Chris. Just going to move to Matthias now. Just on uh, Subway Surfers, how many people have played that game in the room? Quite a few of you. Okay. Well, it's the most downloaded game in the world. So uh, I think a lot of others have as well. So Matthias, just you've been working with us a lot on this, but what have you learned around the interest from players in sustainability? What have you been testing? What have you been exploring? What have you been learning from your experience? First and foremost, uh, happy anniversary. I think that's it's been a, a fun ride to, uh, to bring more companies into the alliance and, and do the work we're doing now. With Subway Surfers, we're having a very diverse both roster of characters. So th thinking a lot about diversity, inclusivity, you can be who you are, you can love who you do, and we do a lot of campaigns in-game and have always done it. I think what we're seeing is that Gaming still has that connotation of being teenagers in a basement, but the 3.3 billion, you only get to that if you include those playing Sudoku and Word Feud and uh, puzzle games uh, in their day to day. So, so we reach a lot more people than just teenagers. With Subway Surfers, we span from, I would say, the five-year-old to the 45-year-old. Uh, people having a break, it's a game you play 20 minutes on average. Uh, a day, we can see now numbers. But what we can do with those 20 minutes is put something inside the entertainment so it becomes more purposeful. And we do that by thinking, um, how can we sprinkle things that don't scare away people, but, it, but uh, increase their interest or awareness in topics that we believe they should be discussing. Whether that's uh, Pride, uh, we do that for the Global Pride Month, or whether we just completed a a three-week campaign of what is your country's best veggie sandwich. Um, and having that as a topic meant that people start discussing eating more plant-based. We're not force-feeding anyone that they could not enjoy some meat, but we're just suggesting that there was an alternative that you at least should be discussing. We've had the same with, 
with windmills and solar panels in the game. We don't expect that people play the game casually and then in immediately invest in new in energy uh, delivery to their home. But we think that there will be places and families that haven't discussed that, that actually start discussing it. So reaching 150 million players every month comes for me with a huge responsibility of what can we do so that we are proud of, of reaching those players, but also how can we see that the players are actually uh, engaging with it. Some of our social posts that have the most traction are actually the ones that talk more purpose. Um, and we see the feedback both in terms of the players enjoying it, but also from the employees, back to Trista's point, the link and the connection between our employees to the fans matters a lot more. And I think that's also why, why it, for me as a CEO, because I really want this to be a CEO agenda for, for every company, um, that we, I also believe that, that that's a strategic advantage in the future, that more companies will have to have some more purpose built into their core product, not just a logo change every once a year or, or post on LinkedIn seen by 1500 people, but putting it into the product and therefore reaching in our case, 150 million people every time. Wow. Okay. So that's a blend of the players want it, the staff want to push this, and you're committed to it as well. Um, just a quick follow-up on that is, um, are you getting any pushback from players? Are they saying, just, we don't need this in our game, leave us to play what we want to play? When you, we've been down on it four billion times. So I know half of those are probably reinstalls people getting new phones. Uh, but that's still a lot of people that, that have tried us or have played us. That means that we are also played by people who don't believe that this is a real issue. We're also played by people who hasn't understood it yet. Uh, some might disagree, some might not just have understood it. But, but that means that we, we promote it knowing that there will sometimes also be backlash mm -hmm. from, from players who say, now you're politicizing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't believe at Cyber that we're progressive neither in our sustainability, inclusivity or diversity agenda. We believe we're humanistic. Mm. So, so the better planet should come as a result of people realizing that we are here together and that it doesn't matter if you're from Denmark or US or anywhere else in the world. Mm. Humanistic. Okay. So just building on that solutions theme in Solutions House, Lisa, one of the key values um, that a lot of people talk about is collaboration and how people work together. Um, you've been running the Green Game Jam for the past four years and learned a lot about how studios are willing to share and work. But what are the one or two things that most impressed you? Uh, I think over the years, it's, it started off with, uh, I think, 11 studios, and it went to 27, uh, 40, 42, and we have a bit over 50 that are participating in the Green Game Jam now. And every year, there's a very nice balance of... Um, uh, returning games and new games that join into the Green Game Jam, which is really nice to see that both studios who have created these, what we call green activations in their games that um, I would say 99% of the time have nothing to do directly with climate and the environment, uh, continue to do these things. So I think that's very special uh, to see. And since the, the industry is actually very competitive, um, when it comes to this topic, a lot of people are willing to share best practices, um, look at different ways how to, how to do things. And the, the amazing thing really is that for all those games that participate throughout the years, none of their green activations is the same, but they, every year they work towards um, the same goal. So, for example, last year we had um, three different wild uh, species, the harlequin toad, the manta ray, and a snow leopard, which appeared in 40 different games that had nothing to do with any of these species in 40 different ways. And all of these games managed to, um, to collect uh, or to raise over $700,000 to support organizations on the ground that, um, uh, yeah, that, that protect these species. So I think that's really, really special. And another thing, often we get a lot of feedback from within the studios that um, teams love working uh, on this. And this is something that brings different people from within an organization that normally don't work together, um, together to work on something new that is out of the day to day, uh, what they're doing, which helps them a lot with, with getting um, 
a lot of new new energy just get out of your daily routine. And I think that's really positive as well. Plus, as Matthias just mentioned, that some of the um, uh, communication around these uh, purpose-driven posts are the highest uh, in engagement. That's what we see with many other studios as well. So it's a really, it's it's a win-win uh, for, yeah, for everybody involved, for players, for the environment, for, uh, I would even say, employee retention, because people are happy uh, to work on these type of things. So I think that's really special. Uh, those online those in the audience, we will have some time, some questions to have a think about those um, and send them in if you're online. J just um, want to build on what, what Lisa has been talking about, but turn to you, Lucy, which is in the green game, there's an opportunity to really open up uh, ways within which games can make a difference. Um, I wonder if you've got any ideas around what you think could be opportunities for gamers to make contributions. Thank you, Sam. And yeah, I'd love to pick up on that and also uh, listen together some of the themes you've heard about community building and targeting gamers on what. And the piece I'd love to bring is um, when we work across different industries with the entertainment industry, for example, of the creators and influencers, we often find that um, it's quite helpful to have a little bit of a shortcut on what to target people on. So, you know, which behaviors? You mentioned plant-based eating, for example. Um, and the piece I'd love to bring is, um, uh, we worked together with um, uh, Project Drawdown, uh, who published widely on this area, and I would really point you towards them. They do some excellent synthesis of what's out there in terms of what will really make a dent for us as individuals and individual behavior. And we work with them and an agency called BE Works um, over the, and WBCSD um, to relatively recently put out a guide called, as a thing called the Low Carbon Lifestyles Wheel. What it does, it takes the um, guidance from IPCC, so the latest report from IPCC validated this demand side, this need for um, behavior change, and it put out uh, 60 different behaviors. But when you look at those 60 behaviors, well, first of all, you've got to read the whole IPCC report to find them. And secondly, um, they, they're, they're, they're a good base from which we need some synthesis to then use. And they're, they're also outcome-based. So they tend to be things such as food waste or um, uh, you know, low carbon transport. They aren't specific things that any of us could kind of take up or that we in our different organizations can work with. So what we do is we synthesize it down to 33 out of the 60 based on a statistical uh, analysis. So things like plant-based eating are in there, um, even things like you know taking low carbon transport, but some of the kind of ones that don't necessarily have such an impact such as recycling are out. So first of all, we've got a kind of a good base of which of those behaviors will really make a difference for high consuming, essentially global north consumers, which of the behaviors that count or which of the outcomes that count. But then we took an approach where you kind of map back and say, what are the antecedent behaviors? So if we're working on food waste, well, you know, we might want to look at portion size or whatever it may be. Um, so I, kind of, I put this forward because I think it's, you know, when we're all working uh, you know, really heavily on footprint reduction, and, but then thinking about how we can use brain print, it provides a useful kind of shortcut for which behaviors to target on um, and how to kind of go about that in a methodological way. Um, and just finally on that, um, uh, you, you know, what I love about it as well is the, the power of gaming to normalize these, these pieces. So as you said, plant-based eating, but even normalizing the fact, you know, subways, let's take subways rather than getting on the car. So there's this enormous power, subway service and across the industry to kind of um, influence and activate on that. Okay, thanks, Lucy. I just wanted to trust if you wanted to come in on handprint as a frame that you often talk about, around mm. how gamers can make a difference. And Lucy's been talking about the different choices that you could take. So Xbox has been talking about a sustainability handbrake. Can you mm -hmm. tell us what's what's involved in that? Similar concept for sure. And I, it looks like we've got technical difficulties, so we can't share with you the video, as I understand. <laughs> um, but the concept is, as we know, human activity has a negative impact on the planet. There are so many things that 
are beyond our control regardless of how we optimize or that we just haven't reached those solutions yet. One of the really important concepts to think about is also just as we make a footprint on the planet, we can also make a handprint, a positive mark on the planet through executing and empowering everyone to do more. And that concept for us internal to Xbox has been very engaging, that sense of everyone can have a hand in this. Raise your hand if you're interested in learning more about sustainability. Giving the entire workforce a sense of place and understanding that sustainability is everyone's job. Even though I direct sustainability in gaming at Microsoft, it is not one person's role. In fact, it's the job of that person to make sure that every single person inside the organization understands specifically what they can be doing in their own role in any moment in time and be able to prepare them so that they can create the most powerful actions possible when the opportunity strikes and to share that information with others so that they can leverage opportunities across an entire creation ecosystem. Everything from where you're sourcing the materials for which you build devices, designing right now, we're working with biomimicry, so learning from nature as model and mentor to design new products that are more environmentally friendly and also more circular in their construction and execution to the place where the devices get into consumers' hands and empowering them to do more and better with their devices and their gameplay, the game creators themselves, as well as all the way through to the take back programs by which we can bring devices back into a place where they can be responsibly recycled and turned into future materials for the next round. All of these pieces are part of the handprint and illustrating that to individuals has been a really powerful concept so that we know we can't deny the negative impact that happens on the planet through human activity. We can doggedly continue to pursue as many different solutions as we can to minimize that impact and at the same time, especially relative to the gaming industry, the solutions offered through the creative mechanism, getting more individuals to experience elements and scenes and na nature visuals in photorealistic scenes in games, playing around with solutions, finding ways in which to build up scenarios in games where there's real problem solving with respect to the environment happening and helping to spur critical thinking. And also to use game-based environments to empower children, for example, to learn. Because one of the major things, and I know that you've been talking about this lately, Sam, about the green skills gap. So if we are to meet our sustainability goals, there is a major gap in skill sets that has to be crossed. And Microsoft is very committed to empowering the workforce in order to be able to meet that skills gap and fill it. And next week, uh, this week on Thursday, we'll be presenting at Goals House a session joint with UNICEF and UNESCO on uh, the latest release of a edition of Minecraft. They have at least 11 different climate models that are curriculum based. They are free for use for everyone. And the one we'll be presenting on on Thursday is an AI solutions base, which introduces GIS raster data to children and teaches them inside Minecraft how to work with GIS data and AI to help find where illegal deforestation might be happening. So it's those kinds of simulation environments that you can do in game that draw kids in. Any of you that have kids know how addictive this stuff is. So we can leverage that addictiveness, that contagiousness, the joy and fun of learning in order to introduce different skills, different mechanisms, different ways of playing around and join people together to create that sense of community so that more people can do great work with it. Yeah, I think that whole premise of learn to play is really powerful, particularly in Minecraft. Um, 
Trista, just while I've got you, just a question I want to come back to you is, we've talked about handprint, but footprint. Um, AI is coming through quite strongly. <clears throat> Different opinions about source for good, um, source for increase. I just wonder what your take is on, on how that can be utilized uh, to really help on pulling emissions down and what your kind of perspective on that might be. AI is one of those very interesting pieces. The most recent developments, of course, we're all looking with curiosity and trepidation of how this is all going to work out for us. When we look at AI, Microsoft is committed to all of the different sustainability goals that were set out in 2020. Same to be with whether it's respect to being carbon negative, water positive, waste, zero waste, or protecting land and ecosystems, the same commitment exists. And one thing that I'm really proud of is my coworkers, there are so many different investigations going on, looking analytically at the way in which AI creates impacts, and then how to turn that analytical lens on those impacts, using AI to bring those impacts down. Um, when I reflect on things like gaming code, a uh, greening code, one thing that really encourages me is that the gaming industry was very, very skeptical that it would be po possible to reduce the energy impacts of gaming use phase emissions through greening code, because we all know that game designers maximize the potential of the devices that they have access to. That is true, but using the power of insights from game creators to notice when there are energy anomalies, meaning that there is a massive spike in energy consumption that doesn't align with an additional benefit to the gamer. There's really no reason for that energy spike to exist. Greening code started as being able to empower game creators through their hunches of when they thought that this energy spike was happening. Gamers hear it, their fans were in their consoles, or they, you know, gamers, they also have power bills. And so all of this comes down to the gamers noticing and game creators noticing. So the sustainability toolkit is free for use on anybody on the eco, Xbox ecosystem, but we've also given the invitation to any studio and any game creator to work with us or let us know where they're looking to be able to identify those energy anomalies. AI can allow us to search and optimize the searches for those en energy anomalies and make sure that we can reduce the useless or the energy consumption that's very wasteful that doesn't add to productivity. And that's true of the entire ecosystem and the way in which we approach the gaming value chain. Great. And just one note to that is the collaboration with Epic on Fortnite led to a significant saving in energy by just taking out the over-rendered menu setting that just didn't need to be playing as, as hard as it was on energy. And it's just noticing things that you can just kind of flick the switch in the back end and it just does remarkable things. So I do think what Xbox have started to notice is starting to change the culture. And it's when we change the culture of how people think about how they can do things that we can really start to make a dent on them. So just, just building on culture. I'm just curious around the Green Game Jam, just with Lisa and Matthias. Um, just to get your take, it's it's got 50 very big games in there now, like PUBG have done all kinds of remarkable things over the past couple of weeks. And I just wondered what you've learned from the Green Game Jam and what maybe you think some of the big stories of impact are that you could share. So Lita, I'll turn to you first. Yeah, but I think we've learned that um, everything is possible if you if you set your mind to it and you're willing to explore what you can do. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we had the wildlife theme uh, last year. The year before, we had um, forests and uh, future and food as a theme where we planted over 2.5 million uh, trees as part of the activations from games. And the year before, we had forests and oceans with uh, 100,000 that signed petitions. 
And this year, um, we're doing something completely different. We're trying to get 1 million players to take an action in the real world that supports the planet, which are focusing on um, food, uh, waste, or restoration. So Subway Service is focusing on food, uh, and, and the, the other 50 games are focusing also on food or different things. And for us, it's really, this has been something completely new. We haven't been sure whether we should pursue this route because it's asking a lot uh, from studios to ask their players and using different things and, uh, that, that they have been used to in the past four years of Green Game Jam. But what we've seen is that for every game, really, there is an environmental theme that fits. Um, it's just important that games uh, take the time uh, to explore what really works, to really understand what makes your player base tick and uh, what, what works for them. Because every game is different, every audience is different, and every team has different resources. But in the end, uh, um, there, there is always a way uh, yeah to, yeah, to find a way to implement an environmental theme. And I think that's um, something that we've learned over the years, that no matter what it is, studios will find a way. And with the Green Game Jam, what we do is we provide that theme, we provide the resources and the knowledge to help studios to be successful. And then from there, they go their own way. And it's amazing to see the creativity that comes from it. Mm -hmm. um, and. Yeah, I think for this year, everything went live earlier this month. We don't have results yet on whether we'll reach that, that one million, but the, the goal really is to, as Matthias also said, to get people to think differently, to open up conversations that may have otherwise not been started. But we're doing a research piece connected to this year's uh, Green Game Jam as well. And that report should come out in February next year. Um, so really looking forward to see um, yeah, the outcomes of that. I think for us, the, the learnings have been plentiful. So we, whenever I speak, I, I encourage everyone in the crowd to do something more. I don't care what your position is or what your role is, but do something. When given the choice, choose right. So if it's a feature choice, choose the one that's more just, more social, more green. If it's hiring a profile, take the one you have the least of in the company and, and so all the way through, think, how can you nudge yourself as well? Uh, by having the game jams, we have a framework that means that the, the cadence also encourages more employees to sign up. And it's part of a bigger thing, so it's not just a disciple initiative. We have plenty of those as well. But I think through the game jam, we start having those. I think it was uh, Pippi Longstocking uh, before Spider-Man who said that with great power, her version was that if you're immensely strong, you have to be immensely kind. And I think that's what we really carry with our player base, that we want to make sure that we use that with kindness to reach more people and to, to encourage them to do something. And then I think the, the other thing is that we are seeing, one is creating awareness, so the outbound activating a million players, and the other one is the inbound. How can we use with Playmob and others, Jude, uh, we wrote a book about gaming for good. How can you make the players' voices be something that drives policy changes uh, in the UN, in the nation states? I think both are super important and something that the game jam, jam somehow becomes a very clear example for studios that have engaged yet of something they can opt into. So we start having the notch going even further and hopefully next year, Trista will tell us that the eco mode is the opt out <laughs> um, because th that's happening through these through these talks and through people uh, loving the initiatives. It is in fact already opt out because it's been so energy saver, so popular, and we've seen that it's something that w has been widely adapted across the Xbox ecosystem. So now it's default setting, and those that don't want it can reset it back. But we found almost no reversion in terms of the application of that set. Perfect. Done. <laughs> <laughs> and just Trista, just at Xbox, on green activations in games, I mean, Minecraft is built for that premise, but in the other games that you have, is this a live conversation with other studio heads and art directors? Yes, for sure. One of the things that I'm really excited about is the way in which we're able to empower all creators to do more and think differently about how we approach sustainability in gaming. It can be through nature and the narrative. It can be through a skin. It can be a 
individual character, it can be in a pop-up menu, it can be through collaboration. Jude Ower is one of the co-founders of Playing for the Planet, and so we are releasing the UN Climate Survey for gamers internal to Xbox on the Insider program, so that individuals that are gamers that maybe are not interested in sustainability at all still have an opportunity to take 30 seconds and give their feedback on how concerned they are about climate. So the reach of the gaming industry and allowing our social feedback systems to understand what gamers care about and be able to internalize that into future decision making is ever so important. Gamers are young, they are deeply engaged in gaming environment, but sometimes they're also disengaged from the kinds of forums like so many that we are participating in in this week. And we need to figure out a way to establish that connection so that they can begin to create and use gaming environments to create the world in which they want. And so I think that there's a lot of really great potential that's coming out with that. Just, I think that world be building piece, and it's it's um, there's a, there's an un, there's an underserved angle, I think, around gaming and sustainability, in that we spend a lot of time thinking about how we we're status driven people, and we live in a society where status signifiers are important, whether it's you know the bigger house or this or that. And the piece that I love about the world game, the world building in gaming. So my daughter, when she plays Roblox, she'll be like, oh, "Mama, I've just, you like flowers? I've just built you this lovely house, and it's got a greenhouse on the side." It's in the real world. This would be a very carbon intensive house, but I can enjoy it online with a infinite, tiny fraction of the carbon that would be associated with that real world status of the fire. Or you know, so I just think that's a piece that, if you think about bringing everyone in. That's a really, um, I think, underserved angle for the kind of um, for everyone to think about the, the contribution that gaming can make there in terms of status. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we might have a question or opportunity if anyone wants to raise a hand for anything to the panel. So if you do, now is the time to raise this up. And we can play the video on the way out. And we can well. play the video. Yeah. So I'll take one from the middle. Yes, sir. Hi, everyone. Um, the panels talked about the efforts you made on the education side to the gamers and the consumption of energy side um, as well. Can you share your, more about your efforts when it comes to uh, scope three emissions reduction in advertising? Because we, we know that various um, studies have shown that three to four percent of carbon emissions come from digital media. So curious to know if this comes into play for Microsoft or any of you guys. Yes. I can take that one. Um, that's a really interesting area. Playing for the Planet has a working group on sustainability in marketing. So one, <clears throat> one wonderful thing about Playing for the Planet is that oftentimes as companies and studios are trying to tackle sustainability challenges, if you have to start everything from the beginning, it's a very high cost endeavor. If you come together and playing for the planet and you're sharing knowledge and recognizing that sustainability and climate is not a competitive sport. When everybody plays on this front, everyone wins. And so it's to our advantage to work deeply together across competitive boundaries. So the work group on sustainability and marketing is a really important work group for exchanging of information people daylighting some of the challenges that they're having and figuring out a divide and conquer way in order to bring together that knowledge, that's one thing. Internal to Microsoft there, we also have our new friends from Activision Blizzard King that have recently come under the umbrella of the Microsoft system. One of the great things about that is they also bring a really wonderful sustainability team that is super accomplished doing a lot of projects that I had no idea about. And so there's been really great experiments and also the tying and quantification of the way in which marketing can, currently they have a wonderful understanding of that in quantitative form. And then also they did analysis on the best ways in which they can shift marketing and the use of data centers in order to make sure that that is the most 
sustainable as possible. So those results are not yet public, but that work has been underway for quite some time. And it's through the ecosystem and sharing of information between studios and companies, the sharing of knowledge. So within the Xbox ecosystem and across the Microsoft ecosystem, but then across competitive boundaries, getting all of that information out, publishing how-to guides to do all of this work is also a place of great leverage. I mean, I just want to supplement because I think this is the strength of the Alliance. It's a, it's a huge topic and something that needs to be solved. For us as a small company, we're the biggest of the small ones or the smallest of the big ones. We have 200 people. Um, we, we wouldn't be able to affect this. So the fact that uh, Microsoft is doing huge initiatives that others can learn from, Tencent is doing great initiatives, and you have more of the bigger ones doing it, but because there's an alliance, we start seeing, so uh, Matt Fisher, the head of the App Store, just did a category for green games. Uh, Google is doing interesting stuff on highlighting which games are working on it, and that means that we would not be able to say to our servers, make them greener. But being part of the alliance, we could say, look, we, we would like more of this so it happens as a, as, a, as a function of bigger corporates investing heavily and smaller companies being part of the movement. Great. I've got a flashing red light here I need to warn about. Um, I think if you, you guys have got questions, we're happy to come and talk to you afterwards. That's okay. And just talk it through. Um, I just want to play out this film that just summarizes all we've done in five years. Um, so I'm really sorry to you two for not taking the questions, but we are, we are tight on time. But um, if I can ask my colleagues upstairs on the left if we can press the button, and hopefully things work this time. Fingers crossed. There are over 3.3 billion players in our world today, but only one planet to play on. The games industry has a unique opportunity to help protect it. From the studios leveling up their environmental impact to the players of every generation making a difference through play. Facilitated by the United Nations Environment Programme, Playing for the Planet is an alliance of studios, publishers and other games organizations committed to taking action on climate, nature and pollution. Since forming in 2019, Alliance members have spearheaded innovations to reduce the industry's carbon footprint, developing, modeling and sharing best practices on decarbonization in a spirit of collaboration. The achievements I'm most proud of is when we have reached across competitive lines to help each other develop new insights and innovation and spread impact far beyond what we could have done if we were just one company operating alone. Together, we've built a carbon calculator for studios to measure their emissions, reached millions of players through green activations and games, and promoted sustainability across the industry by celebrating the work of those leading the way. One of the things we were asked to do when we joined the Playing for Planet Alliance was to use virtual reality to try to bring the message about climate change to our audience. And I'm particularly proud of that journey. We're now in the process of producing and about to launch climate stations in the world. We've taken it to the various UN assemblies and the feedback is phenomenal. So we really believe using this technology, we can help make a difference. Through playing for the planet's annual Green Game Jam, studios have engaged their players on a wide variety of environmental themes, planting over 2.5 million trees and raising over $1.5 million towards environmental causes in the process. Uh, the Mobile Green Game Jam, we've been visiting cities like Bali, Vancouver, we've had an underwater theme where we can show a greener, lusher world, but also activate the players to think about their behavior and activate them in real life. But there's more that we can do together. As the climate crisis continues to impact ecosystems and communities around the world, the scale and ambition of our action must rise to meet it. Hundreds of millions of people play our games every single month. And if you can raise the awareness for this uh, important course, even just a little bit, that's going to have the biggest impact. Games represent one of the largest entertainment industries in the world. Studios and publishers can harness their platforms for impact, telling stories that inspire people to action, mobilizing gaming communities into global movements, and charting bold new sustainability commitments for technology and entertainment. We touch the hearts and minds of billions of players. So we should be helping them develop more empathy, more resilience, 
encouraging them to explore what's possible, to imagine different futures. No matter where, how, and why we play, all of us can play a role in looking after our world. We are playing for a more sustainable games industry. We are playing for a better future. We are playing for the planet. Great. Well, I think we'll end it on that note, but just to say many thanks to, to Trista, to Matthias, to Lisa and Lucy, and thank you for all attending. Uh,